my background, as Jim mentioned, I was a practitioner. I kind of grew up with PERS. I, when I, I came out of school, late 80s, and there it was. It ravaged my client base. I went back to graduate school to get my PhD as a practitioner and just end up staying at the university specifically to work on PERS. And so I've been there 12 years, and uh, basically this is how I felt <laughs> if you look at this slide. That's the last 10 of these years have been working strictly on this issue of transmission and biosecurity. And I know that's what Beth really wanted to focus on tonight. And so I'm really glad to be here. And I, I ask you to, you know, any questions you want, any time, feel free to, to ask them. If you disagree, feel free to disagree. That's fine with me. I have a found cell phone at the reference go. desk. If you're missing a cell phone, please come to the reference desk. Thank you. Very good. We don't want to miss that. If you have opinions and experiences to share with everybody, please share them. Let's make this a discussion. We've got some time. And um, so I'm going to focus real hard on, on these two topics here, transmission and biosecurity. OK, so as we know, uh, area regional control elimination of PERS is alive and well throughout the country. We've got a lot of projects going on. This is actually an old slide given to me from, by Dale Polson. Uh, from BI back in July, and there's new projects now in North Carolina, there's more projects happening in Minnesota, and you can see yourself up here has always been one of the leaders across this uh, effort. And so this is alive and well, and I think going extremely well. I applaud you again for, for jumping in so early and getting things going. There's a lot of veterinary support, you know, in regards to the AASV, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. A lot of us believe that eradication of PERS from the North American uh, population is the right thing to do. This is our position statement that I wrote when I was a president in conjunction with the executive board back in 2005. So the veterinarians kind of drew the line in the sand back uh, at that time. But it's really been the producers, lately especially, that have come forward with some key leadership. You can see the resolution that was passed last year at Forum talking about some of these principles on PERS virus elimination and I've highlighted is some of the key language in red. You can see a united goal and support and identify resources and this is not a government mandated program. So some very important language that the producer leaders got into, uh, into the uh, resolution that was passed and there's actually another resolution coming forward from the National Pork Board at this, uh, this year's forum, so hopefully that can, can get through too. So, good leadership. But a lot of challenges, you know, a lot of challenges with this virus. You know, many different varieties of this virus now. And it seems to get worse and worse and worse. New viruses uh, have, have evolved and reemerged over the last, especially the last few years. You know, if you hear about the 184 and the 1182 and the 1262 and the 144, and we don't know what will be next. Uh, so it's, it's not sitting still. And we know that elimination is possible at the herd level, but reinfection is a frequent event. And that's been concerning to a lot of people. You know, I clean up my farm and I get infected with a new virus. I didn't know where it came from. That's been an Achilles heel in moving forward with elimination. And as a former practitioner, I understand that. I understand the economics. I understand the, the emotional devastation. I understand the issues with animal welfare in regards to this. That's tough, tough medicine. And speaking of tough, in Minnesota, I think we've just gone through our, what I'll call our toughest high PERS season in many years. High PERS season is what we call basically October through January, where we have a lot of our outbreaks. And this year it was really bad. I mean, we had not a new strain, so to speak, but these characters on the slide up here just spreading farther and faster and more virulent than we've ever seen them before. So things have been really tough in southern Minnesota. And so the bottom line is we got to know how this thing moves around and we got to know how to stop it if area regional control and elimination has a chance to succeed. And so therefore, the topic for discussion this evening. And so following Beth's lead, what I would like to do is talk about some specific routes of spread and biosecurity protocols that we've studied over the years. And I've listed them here on the slide for you. So I'm going to talk about inanimate objects, first of all, fomites, and we'll introduce those. We'll talk about people, whether they can carry the virus. We'll talk about transport. There's a great 
emphasis in this group here to talk about transport, so we're going to do that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on bugs. We can talk about them if you want to. It's not really insect season anyway, and they're a very low risk, but we did a lot of work on them. We understand what they can do, but tonight I'm probably not going to spend a great deal of time on it. And then aerosols. There was a big call for uh, some discussion about aerosol transmission and our work with air filtration that I think you'll find interesting. So those are the primary topics that we're going to visit about this, day, this evening. Okay? So let's just talk first of all about fomites. And I'll define fomites in this case as needles or boots and coveralls. And all, and so inanimate objects basically. And so we've done a number of trials looking first at needles and we know that PERS circulates in the bloodstream. And we know that PERS virus can be spread from pig to pig by the same needle. We've done a number of, number of trials on this now. Uh, you see a couple of uh, pieces of data up on the slide. You see it's very easy to move this virus by the needle. So we'll vaccinate, say with mycoplasma, some infected pigs. And we'll take that same needle and syringe and vaccinate for mycoplasma some negative pigs. Okay? And we can move the PERS virus just on the needle itself. And we can swab that needle, and if there's blood there, you can find the virus on the tip of that needle. Very, very basic, straightforward. Okay? And we even have evaluated some of these needleless or needle-free injection systems, and one is the AccuShot. And you can see there, too, that even the AccuShot, it reduces the spread of the virus, but it doesn't prevent it all the time. So four times we tried the AccuShot, a needleless injection system, in order to uh, vaccinate some infected pigs. We moved it to clean pigs and vaccinated them. In one of four trials, pigs became infected. And I think that was because the force of the AccuShot actually broke the skin. And you could see some of the blood on the necks, and you could see some of the blood on the AccuShot machine. And so it's, that's, that's how it, we believe that happened. Okay? So needles can clearly move the virus from pig to pig. All right? Same with boots and coveralls. We've done some work where we'll go into a pen of pigs that are infected, and we'll just take care of them, just walk them, and let them you know, come in contact with them, and then not change our coveralls and boots, and we can easily walk the virus from one pen of infected pigs to a pen of clean pigs. And we can swab those boots and coveralls, and we can find virus on the, on the surface of the cloth or the rubber. I mean, fairly straightforward stuff that I think you're probably all familiar with. But just to reinforce that fomites can play a role. What about people? What about people? Can people carry the virus? Well, we've done some trials where we spent time in infected populations, infected pig air spaces, doing chores, working with animals, and then swabbing ourselves. And I show you here in one trial, try to find where the virus is on the person after contacting infected pigs. And you can see in the, we did find some virus on our hands. So the palms of the hands, after we'd handling those animals, we could find virus. That's not surprising. It's excreted in the saliva. It's excreted in the nasal secretions, the blood, of course. So we're going to get that material on our hands when we're working our animals. That's not surprising. And again, boots and coveralls, OK? Where we didn't find the virus, this is what's more important, is we did not find the virus in our oropharynx or our, our mouth region. We didn't find it up our noses. And we didn't find it in our hair or on our fingers or our, under our fingernails. And so it's a pretty straightforward conclusion here is that the human doesn't become a carrier of this virus. It doesn't live up in your upper respiratory tract or your nose or your mouth. And you're not going to carry that into another farm. Okay? So we know that for sure. But you will find it on your hands. And if we move then from infected pigs to clean pigs and handle those clean pigs because the virus is on our hands, we will infect those pigs. And you can see a couple of trials out of four attempts where we did actually move the virus by contact with our hands from infected to clean pigs. The good news is when we went through a number of biosecurity interventions early on, they all worked. You know, basically shower in, shower out with 12 hours of downtime, we prevented the spread of the virus in all four times we tried that. How about shower in, shower out without downtime? Yep, that blocked the spread as well. That cleaned us up. And then even the Danish system where it was a boot and coverall and a hand wash. So no shower, 
just changing coveralls and boots and washing our hands, we're able to prevent the spread of the virus. And so in, a, in very small numbers of trials here, we showed, at least preliminary, that it's pretty easy to clean us up. We're not long-term carriers, okay? And again, any questions, please feel free. Now, let's do this again. Let's do this in a bigger setting, though, and let's do this again more times to see if those replications were accurate. So here's at our research farm that I'll talk quite a bit about today. It's in west central Minnesota. It's a very isolated area. There's no pig barns within 10 miles. We can actually bring in virus and infect pigs on the site and, and really understand how it moves throughout a population. We'll talk about that quite a bit. But just to see if our work was accurate, if we could really move the virus mechanically by people and by fomites, we spent some time, as you can see, coming to this research site. We'd come into our source population of pigs which were infected with first virus 1A4. We'd do chores. And then we'd go directly into what we call a, a low biosecurity facility, where we walked right into that building. is about 120 meters of, of, of walking across the yard. We went right in that building without any intervention at all and, and did chores, handled those pigs. We might bleed those pigs. we bring feed bags over to feed them from the source population. we bring a hog snare over from the source population. We did this seven times. All seven times we were able to infect pigs in this facility here. And we're also able to find virus anywhere we looked, basically. After handling infected pigs in that source barn, it was pretty easy to find virus on us, again, our hands, our boots and coveralls, on our equipment that started out in the infected premises and moved into the, into the clean premises, our hog snares, our bleeding equipment. And so, again, just to kind of demonstrate that fomites and people, under these conditions, without any intervention, you can move the virus from infected to clean pigs. So just more data to support the earlier study. Okay, so that kind of brought us into the next question that a lot of us vets argue and arm wrestle over, is what about downtime? Is that really necessary to move from pig farm to pig farm with a specific period of downtime? And some of these downtimes are, people aren't long-term carriers, are they really necessary? Do you need 48 hours? Do you need 72 hours? Maybe all you need is one night. And so let me tell you a little bit about a project that we just wrapped up looking to see if one night of downtime was sufficient to spread, prevent the spread of PERS virus as well as mycoplasma pneumonia by people. So let me explain this diagram here for you. So this again is at our research farm, and this was actually a four-year study. And so we've just completed a very large project on this farm. It's been running for four years. It's been looking at aerosol spread and air filtration, and we're going to talk all about that. We also been tracking to see if we could move the virus from an infected source population to a clean population with a downtime of one night. So this is what we did every day. At the end of the day, we're doing chores in our contaminated population. We're moving from our high-level clean pigs downstream or down the health pyramid, and at the end of the day, we're all we're doing our work in our uh, lowest health status facility, just like you would on a normal protocol. So this is a population of 300 grow finished pigs. They're infected with PERS virus and mycoplasma. And you know, that's we've shown already that if we contact those pigs and we move right into a negative group of pigs, seven out of seven times, right, we move that virus. Now, for 1,438 straight days, we go from here into the house, take a shower, one night down, come back the next morning, shower back into the house, put on our farm clothes, and then go right into our highest health facility, a filtered facility, and negative pigs for both bugs in these facilities. Now, we'll get more into that in a minute, but just, just to tell you that for 1,438 days, we went this direction in this kind of a circle, and we slobbed ourselves as we moved into this high-level facility every morning, as we walked into that facility, put on coveralls and boots specific for that facility, we took swabs of ourselves, just like we had done early. And basically, we couldn't find anything on us. So 7,000 swabs for PERS virus were negative, 
more than almost 5,000 swabs were negative for mycoplasma, and the pigs in this facility never became infected, even though just earlier that previous day in the, in the afternoon, really a period of about 14 hours, really, we'd been in this population, we'd been contaminated, we'd done our chores, we'd been right in the pens with the pigs, pulling out the deaths, bleeding them, feeding them, taking care of them, scraping the pens, doing all the things you do on a, on a given day. Okay? But we never, ever found it on ourselves after a shower in, shower out, and a one night down, shower back in the next day, and then you go. All right? So it kind of makes you wonder if some of these extended downtimes are really that valuable when it comes to at least these agents. All right? So any questions on what we did there? How it flowed? Makes sense? Yes, sir? How far apart were those facilities? They were off uh, about a uh, hundred yards apart. Yes, ma'am. About a hundred yards. And we'd walk between them. The okay? All right. We also had a little downtime control in this study. What if we didn't even have one night down? What if we had an hour down? What if we went, first of all, from the house to the source population, did our chores, Let's say something had gone wrong in this facility here. We had to get into it. Let's say fans went out or some emergency had come up. Could we clean ourselves up in a shorter period of time and enter that facility again? So from here we go back here. We take a shower. Basically, it took one hour to get that whole process done before we could come back into this facility. And again, the same result. We never infected those pigs in that high-level filtered facility, even though an hour prior we had been doing chores in this heavily contaminated population. Okay? Yes, Beth? Was the contaminated population, was that a facility filtered also, or just your high health facility? Just a high health facility. The contaminated population was a continuous flow, 300 type <coughs> row finished barn that we kept going. We kept bringing pigs in there every two to four weeks to keep the pathogens circulating. We had about an 8 to 10 percent mortality in that barn and a whole bunch of cults. So this was clearly a, a source population. Its purpose in the models we'll discuss was to produce aerosols for the model when we test our air filtration. We'll get into that later. But yeah, this was a hot zone. Okay, good questions. All right. So we're starting to understand a little bit about the risks of people, the risks of fomites, and how we can reduce those risks. What do you need to do? We need to take our showers, we need to wash our hands, we need to change our clothes and our footwear. Basic stuff. We need to have clean materials. This is common sense. We have to bring clean materials into our clean herds. We just can't bring, you know, contaminated materials into our clean farm. It is common sense. You guys know that. But we're starting to get some science behind it now. <clears throat> All right, so that's what I wanted to show you about fomites and people. So if any time that doesn't make any sense, you know, feel free to fire up. Okay? Good. What about trucks? Beth wanted to have uh, quite a bit of discussion on trucks, and so I, I went back in time and found all my old slides on my original truck work I'd done many years ago. And so we've got all sorts of uh, data now on trucks, and they all started, it all started with little models. I don't know if you remember any of this, but we actually built little models of wean pig trailers to start with. They're only about this big. And they were about a 1 to 150 scale model of a wean pig trailer, because we better start small first before we go jump right into the full size unit. This is how we started. And so we take infected pigs. These guys are a little big. But we take infected pigs and we put them in this, in this little trailer. And in Minnesota, the average time to move uh, from a sow herd to a wean to finish is about a two-hour travel time, looking at some of the Genetoport data. And so we leave them in there for two hours. We take them out. We just clean them, just like we start to clean the trailer, you know, scrape out all the shavings and that. We swab that trailer to see if we could find virus after those pigs had been in there for two hours. And then we'd try to clean these trailers up. We'd power wash them. We'd spray various disinfectants inside to kind of understand which disinfectants might be more efficacious. 
And this is 2002, 2003 timelines here, so we didn't know anything about this at the time, so we're starting from scratch. We heat them up, we blow air in them, dry them out, or else we just let them sit, you know? So we're looking at, how, let's try to start to clean these babies up. Let me show you what we learned from our models. Let me explain this little table for you. So we have a number of treatments here. We've got washing. We've actually got potassium, uh, that's formaldehyde gas, so that was kind of a big thing, you know, fumigate the trailers with potassium and formaldehyde. This is Vircon. This is Synergize. And this is drying, so no treatment, just dry. And so we've got pre-treatment swabs. We've got 20 replications for each of these treatments. And so washing over the water and then swabbing, you see lots of virus. 20 out of 20 times we found virus in those trailers after we washed them out. So washing alone across all the treatments before any of these were applied doesn't do much, does it? You might get some of the organic material out, but the virus is still there. Now, after treatment, so here's washing again. <coughs> 20 out of 20 were positive. Formaldehyde fumigation, 20 out of 20 were positive. Vircon disinfection, dropped it down. Synergize, in this case, looked pretty good. And here's drying. All right, so heavily contaminated trailers with different treatments showing different results afterwards. Now, we wanted to see also if, they, if these trailers were still containing infectious virus. <laughs> And so we put negative pigs back in these trailers, four replications, and you can see, for example, two out of four replications in a washed-only trailer, pigs became infected sitting in there for two hours. Same with the uh, fumigation of formaldehyde gas. Vircon was one out of four times, pigs became infected, Synergize was zero out of four, and drying was zero out of four. And then when we took some of our swab material and inject it into negative pigs, what we call a bioassay. Infectious virus was here, live virus was here, it was still here, it wasn't here, and it wasn't here. So these little models started to give us some indication of what were some of the more efficacious treatments to use on these trailers. Okay, that makes sense? All right. Then we started saying, well, let's look at some other disinfectants. We got a couple of disinfectants in the first round. Let's test a whole bunch of disinfectants in another model. And so these are just a bunch of various disinfectants. I can't even remember which ones they are, except the red one's the Synergize product, I know that. But we would contaminate these models, then we would treat them, we would disinfect them, and then we would swab them after 30 minutes of uh, post contact with the disinfectant, and then 60 minutes after contact with the disinfectant. So you can start to see some differences in how these disinfectants were working, at least in this model level, okay? All right, so some of the products appear to be more efficacious than the others. Now in Minnesota, trailers freeze, and freezing slows down disinfection properties. In fact, disinfectants actually quit working if the trailer gets all iced up. And so we wanted to see how these disinfectants would work if we froze them, but maybe we had a little way to keep them from freezing real hard. So we, we put the trailers actually with virus into this deep freeze, but we treat them different ways. So this is windshield washer fluid. We wanted to see if we could use windshield washer fluid to keep the disinfectant active, to prevent the trailer from turning into a big ice block. Okay, so windshield washer fluid as your good one instead of water. You can see all by itself, it has a little bit of methanol in it, so it had a little bit of an effect on the virus, but the washer fluid by itself can do a whole lot. Washer fluid plus Synergize worked pretty good, so it didn't freeze up. This is propylene glycol, so a 10% propylene glycol is water solution, which will reduce freezing as well. By itself, had a little effect. But when combined with the disinfectant again, it worked pretty good. So it kept that trailer from freezing up and allowed that disinfectant to continue to work. Water all by itself, you can see, oh, it froze everything up. The virus was still there. 
and then water plus the, disinfe uh, the, the disinfectant, it helped a little bit, but it didn't do as good of a job as the other additives. And so we've got some ways now that we can treat these traders to reduce freezing if drying is not an option. Yes, sir? Uh, what was the consistency of each that was like 50-50 mix, or what did you do to make that work? The mix was one ounce per gallon, just like you would with water. So an ounce of disinfectant to a gallon of windshield wiper fluid, for example, 10% um, propylene glycol mixture with an ounce of disinfectant. So we tried to use it just like just as if it was water, same ratio of of product to diluent. Okay. All right. Now it was time to move into the big trailers. I think we've done enough with the little models. And we actually set up a, a testing system in a full-size trailer that PIC provided for us. And we came up with a way to inoculate this trailer with virus. We basically took the vaccine virus, the live vaccine virus, and we'd spot <coughs> virus throughout the trailer in all sorts of places. You can see some spots where we, I just took the picture to show you where we put it. We put it in the corners put it right in the middle of the floor, for example. We put it on the ramp. We put it in the hinge of the gate, up in the beams, behind the lights. We put it in places where maybe it was hard to reach or hard to, for a disinfectant product to get to it, all right, or hard to dry out. You know, some simple sites, like right on the floor, but also some hard to reach spots that might have a physical barrier, okay? And so we contaminate this trailer, so to speak, and then we treat it to see if we could clean it up or not. Now again, we are working with, again, the synergized product, but we wanted to see at a 1 to 128 dilution if it was better to fog the disinfectant or if it was better to foam the disinfectant. The thought was maybe the foam is better because you can see where you're going, for one thing, and the foam may allow the disinfectant to adhere to the surface of the trailer better. And so basically we came in, somebody who was blind to where the vaccine was placed would come in and treat the trailer. Would fog it first of all. You can see we did 10 replicates. We had a bunch of positive samples containing live virus. So the fogging doesn't really work very good. Well. Back in those days, if you remember, everybody was wanting to fog the trailers. I guess I should have said that earlier. That was a big thing. We're going to fog these trailers. Let's test it. <laughs> well, it doesn't work that good. Well, you foam them, works pretty darn good. You can see the difference in how those two applications work. So now we're starting to see some product differences, and now we're starting to see some application differences. Okay? And now we're starting to get an idea on how to keep them from freezing, and now we've got to see if we can dry them. Because one of the comments I got from the industry was, we got to turn these trailers around in two hours. We can't have these things sitting overnight. It costs too much money. We've got to get them back on the road. And so working again with PIC and a company in North Dakota, they developed what they call the TAD system, Thermo-Assisted Drying and Decontamination, the TAD system. And so we actually tested that by, again, contaminating the trailers, just like we talked. And then taking the heater and running these, these big tubes in the back of the trailer to drive high velocity warm air down the length of the trailer to try to, to get it to dry out faster. Okay? Then we'd come back and swab and see what would happen. We also went to, uh, at that time, Dr. Bush Baker was at Premium Standard Farms. And he had developed the trailer Baker which was a, a big way to heat those trailers up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit for a 10 minute period of time to kind of bake or cook those trailers. So there's one philosophy of the TAD system, which is high velocity air. And then you've got the Baker system, which is high intensive heat for a short period of time. So I went down to see Butch at PSF. Here's their trailer baker, their big heater. Trailers were contaminated just like we'd done before with vaccine virus. Here's his thermal sensors. It's a pretty scientific system he set up. Here's this big tube that blows this, again, really hot air down the length of the uh, trailer. Now we, so we want to test them. Let's see what we learn. So basically, we've got disinfection alone, 
Again, with the synergize, with the 120, 1 to 128 dilution, with the foamer, that's one treatment. The baker, the TAD system, and then no treatment. <coughs> so all these get inoculated with virus, just like we talked. And they get treated, and they get swapped. And this is the number of PCR, the percent of PCR positive samples that we found in each of the following treatments. The disinfection, a very low number, 2%. Trailer Baker, a high number, almost 68% of the samples were, were still PCR positive. The TAD system was much lower, showing us that if we dry the trailer out, that virus just kind of breaks up into little pieces, and it's hard for the PCR test to find them. And look what's happened if we don't do anything. I mean, that thing's still loaded with virus. Now, is it live? Is the virus live? Because the PCR basically just tells you if there's genetic material in it. It doesn't tell you if it's live or not, so we've got to differentiate that. And so we took these samples that were, that were our positives, and we injected them into negative pegs. Again, what's called a bioassay. And look what happened. All three of those different methods were equal when it came to whether the virus was dead or alive. And look what happens when we don't do anything, that virus is still there. Live and well, ready to infect new pegs. There's just how the conditions of the trailer were. Some were wet, some were dry, some were in between, okay? And so what the beautiful part about all this was, it's got options here. There's multiple ways of doing this. Because not everybody can have a trailer baker. Not everybody can have a TAD system. There's maybe some people, you know, still just need, all they can do is disinfect. Well, now we've got options that we can clean up trailers in a two hour period of time, Get them ready to hit the road again. Clean. Okay? Clean as in free of virus. Yes, sir? You're a trailer maker. Would you have a lower percentage if you uh, baked it for a longer period of time? I think you would because eventually you just break that RNA down. But that, uh, that was that protocol they were using at the time. It was a 10-minute, 160-degree bake, so to speak. So I followed exactly. And this was a two-hour disinfection protocol. I mean, clean it, let sit for two hours. And then the TAD was a two-hour application of high-velocity air. So again, the goal was to turn these trailers around in a two-hour period of time. Okay? So that's what we've learned about trucks. Now, yes. what um, that trailer was really clean, I assume, or... Right. Um, do you see different like staining or things or how, to what degree of clean does it take to get those three systems to work? Mm -hmm. What degree? That's, that's a bad question, but yet. Yeah. You had virus on a clean surface. And right. Yeah. I mean, he didn't put organic material into these, so I don't can't really honestly answer that question. But I would assume if there's a lot of debris around, there's going to be less likelihood for the uh, disinfectant to contact the virus, for example. The virus could be shielded and potentially cooled, so perhaps, and then not as dry, maybe kept moist by the material. So I think it's really important that these trailers get clean, just physical, physically clean and washed well to get, to get clean surfaces so you can apply your treatment and make it work. So I think that's, that's a good point. Okay. Now, what if we took people, and we took fomites, and we took transport? All these things we've been talking about in the last few minutes. What if we hook them all together, put all of these potential routes together? Could they work together in an effort to move virus from point A to point B? And so that's where I kind of came up with this idea, what I call the snowball from hell. And the snowball from hell experiment was basically the thought that here's a producer taking a load of hogs to market. You're driving across a contaminated premises. It's all, you know, it's a high-risk facility, right? A lot, of, a lot of different pigs, a lot of different health statuses, a lot of different viruses and bacteria in that. And what if in the winter time, because purse virus lives so well in the winter, what if it's on the ground at that slaughterhouse area? Because it loves to be moist. It can live for 9 to 11 days when it's wet. It can live for months when it's frozen. 
What if as you drive over that surface, as you're unloading your animals, the undercarriage of your vehicle gets splashed with water or ice chunks collect underneath the surface of the undercarriage of your vehicle? Is that a potential way that you can move virus from that premises to your farm? Okay. So the thought was, let's take some snow, let's inject it with virus, and let's try to simulate that. Let's put it under the wheel well of this explorer of mine. And let's see if we can move it. It's a highly artificial, I agree. Let's just see what happens. And so we actually went from the contamination point in this case, 30 miles. And where do we go after the truck launch? I'm sorry, after the uh, slaughterhouse. We go wash the truck, right? We go to the truck launch. We drove it 30 miles to a truck launch. And that snowball was still underneath those blue wheel it hung on there for a 30-mile drive. And we started washing the vehicle, and we got underneath the wheel wells, and these snowballs fell on the floor. Okay, now, we all know it gets steamy and hard to see some of these facilities, and we're paying attention to how we're cleaning our vehicle right now. What if we're watching where we're washing, but not watching where we're walking? And what if we happen to contact some of this contaminated snow with our shoes? Is it possible now that we've contaminated the bottoms of our soles of our boots during our, our, our attempts to clean up our vehicle? And what if we started taking swabs right now at this point in the truck wash floor where that crushed snowball virus was laid? And we got back in our truck now to drive home. <coughs> we swabbed the bottom of our boots. Have we now moved the virus from the truck wash floor into our cab? Let's take a look. And have we placed that virus now on our floor mats? Have we put our feet down and prepared to drive the vehicle back? In this case, 30 more miles to my house, which was actually a, a simulated pig farm in this model. So don't tell my wife. But we drove 30 miles back to my home. And now you all know this, but if you remember back long ago, when we'd come to a farm, we'd enter through the door, we'd take our boots and coats off here, and before we did this work, a lot of times, this floor was really dirty. I was always amazed at how wet and dirty this floor was in what I'll call this anteroom. Uh, you folks probably don't have that problem. But again, this is back 2002, 2003. There wasn't a whole lot of attention paid to this, this floor. And as a practitioner, I'd go into these shower-in areas and I'd go, man, this place is a mess. This floor is dirty. Is that a risk? We'd have our showers that we're going to go in, but this floor was wet and dirty a lot. And here's the old pass-through window, of course, which was open most of the time in those days. And I see containers of materials come into this, these farms and get sat right down on the floor and then pass through the window without any type of, of cleanliness, no sanitation. Now, maybe this is just a Minnesota thing. Maybe it's never happened in Michigan. But it happened all the time in Minnesota. So is that a possible way that when containers come into the farm, supplies come into the farm, they get placed in this potentially contaminated area. Can they move virus then through that pass-through window on the surface of these boxes? And so in my home, I have a little shower-in area of my own that I used as a practitioner to clean up before I come in to the house proper. And so I used this area to, to simulate that anteroom. And I made a little area for boots. And I took my boots as I walked from my cab, you know, here we come through, we've been at the truck wash, we've driven 30 miles, we walked into the farm, we took off the boots, got ready to shower in. Well, here's some fluid on the floor from these shoes that have been sitting there for 10 or 15 minutes. The snow is melting, right? Let's swab that area. Have we walked the virus into the farm now? And here come the boxes. What if the coolers come in? They say, <coughs> a plastic surface. Oh, there's some moisture there. Is there a virus there? How about cardboard? What about medicine boxes and things that come in? Vaccine. They get set up floor. How about semen coolers? How about toolboxes? Now, if I told you that I did this 10 times, the vets might remember this. If I went through this whole thing 10 times, how many times do you think I was able to track virus from the truck wash floor into my cab, via my boots, into this farm, and get these boxes all contaminated? <coughs> How many times out of 10? 
Eight? Yep. Eight out of ten times when I went through that whole rigmarole, <clears throat> I was able to move virus from truck wash into the farm onto a container. We already know where the virus is on people, right? We touch those containers with our hands, we got virus on our hands, we're in the farm with virus on our hands. All right, now, when we did it in the warmer weather with mud instead of snow, we see that the percentage is much lower, right? Because the virus is drying out, there's UV light, there's some of the things it doesn't like. But it still shows you that even in the springtime, even with a, a, like a dirt ball or a mud ball, it's, biosecurity is still important. You can still drag this stuff around throughout your daily events if you don't have interventions. Okay? So this led to D&D rooms or supply rooms where you bring materials in, clean them up, you sit overnight or something. It led to those little benches you sit on and spin around. It led to, you know, the awareness of your footwear as a potential risk factor for carrying virus from the surface into your, into your vehicle. And it led to what I call a bag in a box or double bagging of products. So as products come in now to farms, Frequently, there's a person opening the box on the outside of the window. The person on the clean side reaches through the pass-through window and pulls the bag out with the materials inside to bring that clean bag, but that dirty box stays on the other side. We've tested this too. Okay. So this kind of led to a lot of these things now we kind of take for granted, but that's where a lot of this stuff came from. Okay. So that's a snowball from hell. All right. Bugs I'm not going to mention too much about. But we can certainly have some discussion about insects at another time. I'd rather take your time and get into aerosols. I think there's a lot of interest in this now. All right. So what have we learned about aerosols over the years? The big thing we've learned is not all strains are created equal. Some strains of PERS virus spread via the air and others don't. More recently, though, some of these new... 184s, 182s, 126s, 144s appear to have a much greater propensity for area spread. Okay? So we've compared 184, which is a highly pathogenic strain, causes a lot of disease, to a very low pathogenic strain, and we've seen a difference in shedding. Pigs infected with these high path viruses, like 184, shed viruses in their breath a lot more frequently. Okay. So we actually infected pigs, masked them down, collected their breath, tested it for virus quantity and frequency, and found that pigs infected, in this case with 1A4, besides having higher titers in their blood and their tissues, also had free, more frequent shedding via the airborne route. And transmissibility is greater in 1A4 than this low pathogenic virus. So this was early work we did in 2004, basically to show that there are differences in how viruses move via the air because they're excreted from pigs at different levels and different frequencies. Okay, so aerosol transmission of PERS virus is strain dependent. Not all viruses are created equal when it comes to aerosol spread. And we know now that the vi this virus, this 1A4, can actually spread almost out to six miles in the air. Here's a publication we just put out where we've got our source barn. This is 300 head again at our, uh, at our research farm. There's no pigs around here for 10 miles. We put this 1A4 into this, into this uh, 300 head population and collected air samples at different distances from this facility. We actually had an air collecting machine and we put it in the truck. We move around the facility at different distances and collect air samples. And you can see these five points here where we actually found air samples that contained live PERS virus that was sequenced and matched to show it's the same strain as it came from here. Now 9.1 kilometers is about six miles, a little bit less. That's as far as we looked. Most likely it can go farther. And again, we've only got 300 pigs in here. So this definitely proved that airborne spread is real. It proved that long distance airborne spread is real, okay? So now I don't think there's a whole lot of discussion whether this happens or not. 
we've now been able to prove it. And we know the weather that needs to be there when the virus is spreading and some of the risk factors. Obviously, you need a shedding herd. Okay? I mean, someone's got to be affected. Pigs got to be shedding virus. You've got to have directional winds that move from the shedding herd to an at-risk herd. Okay? It's common sense. But these winds have to move slowly. They have to move about three to four miles an hour to keep that big plume of virus that's coming out of these barns from dispersing. But there needs to be a little bit of intermittent gust winds, six to eight mile an hour winds, little boosts. So this plume kind of moves slowly, and all of a sudden, every once in a while, it gets a little push. Not enough to disrupt it, but to move this balloon of virus over long distances. And we need temperatures of about 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, so cool temperatures. We need relative humidities in the upper 70s to lower 80s. We need some rising barometric pressure readings. That's about 29 to 38 millimeters of mercury. And we need low sunlight levels, like you'd see at dawn or dusk or on cloudy days, because this virus doesn't like ultraviolet light. So the clouds or the fog got to block it. So in other words, when you take all that, high risk day, low risk day. Okay. So we've been able now to document the climate. So today, it's pretty good first day. Wet, cool, <coughs> very foggy. <coughs> You've got the directional winds moving from the high-risk farm to the at-risk farm, and you're at least within a six-mile distance, that at-risk farm is at risk. Okay? So now we start to understand that. And that's why in southern Minnesota we've started to do so much filtration. Air filtration is really an idea from the French, and then into Quebec, and Laura studied this too. She knows a lot about air filtration too. And I went to to France in 2004 to study it because I wanted to see what was going on. Because we just figured out that the airborne spread of the first virus can, is strain dependent. So it was real. Now I was convinced. Now I had to go and understand how to deal with this. How to get U.S. systems <coughs> filtered. Okay. The first thing I did was try to find which filters work best. And I set up a little model where I've got two big chambers connected by a duct. There's a fan and duct. We fog virus here, pull it through the duct. We put the filter right here as a, as a treatment. A real expensive one, and we reduce the cost and see if virus can go from this chamber to this chamber. And here we've got an air collector looking to see if virus can pass that little through that filter across that one, one meter distance. So this, is, this allows us to test which filters work and which filters don't. <clears throat> then we put them into what we call the production region model. And this is our research farm that we just finished a four-year study. And I talked about this earlier, but this model is set up to represent a cluster of pork production, a very dense region of pork production where there's, in this case, four producers living close together. In this case, these facilities, each of these four facilities represent a different producer, they're about 120 meters apart. The first building is, we've referred to it before, as our source population. This is the barn that's infected with PERS virus, in this case, mycoplasma as well. And then downwind, we've got various buildings that can be filtered, treatments, and control. We'll see if the absence of the filter leads to more aerosol spread. Okay, so the purpose of this building is to produce the plume, the cloud, the virus, to blow across the yard and challenge our three producers downwind. And here's our weather station right here collecting that weather data for us to understand what we need for this virus to move. So this is the model really to represent a cluster of producers such as, such as we'd have in southern Minnesota. So this study just finished in, in November of 2010. It ran for a four-year period of time. We talked about it briefly in regards to the downtime. This is where the downtime information came from. It was 1,438 days long. We used 4,700 some pigs. We tested all sorts of different strains of PERS virus and mycoplasma, because those two work together. Mycoplasma makes PERS worse. The pigs cough so much harder. 
and more particles are released when those pigs cough so hard. We've tested a whole bunch of different filters, because just like with trucking options, we wanted to have filter options for producers, because we didn't think one size is going to fit all. And I don't sell filters, so I didn't care if there was one particular filter that was going to make me money. I want it to make you money. I want you to have options with your filters if you choose to go this route, that you might have a different risk level, you might have a different budget, different ventilation system. We've got to have different filters. And so we've tested three different types, and I'll show you some data on those. And all through this whole four-year period, we collected a whole bunch of samples, tracked the virus throughout this model, air samples, swabs of people, any supplies, any flies, the trucks we used, 38,519 samples at 25 bucks a pop. So it's a big study, big bucks. All right, what did we learn? Here's probably the most important thing we learned for you. These are the airborne transmission data by filter type, looking at which filter types are better than others. So first of all, we have PERS virus, as I mentioned, mycoplasma, looking at airborne spread of both of those. In our control facility, 28 out of 65 replications, we had an airborne transmission event occur in our non-filtered control building. That was determined by an air sample collected of incoming air into that non-filtered building that eventually infected pigs in the non-filtered building. We sequenced those viruses and showed them the same one that came from the source. And so we connect the dots from the source via the air to the pigs. That's how we confirmed an airborne transmission event. So 28 out of 65, the replicates are two to four weeks long. So these 65 replicates, again, over a four-year period of time. Same with Michael. We had evidence of airborne spread to our control barn. Mycoplasma too. Okay, good. So the, the, the region is under challenge, right? That's what it's telling us here. That the viruses, the airborne virus, and the airborne bacteria, mycoplasma, are getting downstream and challenging our control barn. But look at the filters. Look at all the different types of filters. And I can explain all these different types later if you want to. But there's different efficiencies here. There's different costs here. There's different mechanics here. The good news is they all worked. Every time we had a filtered population of pigs, they never broke. It didn't matter what filter we used. Expensive ones, the less expensive ones, they all worked. 0 out of 39, 0 out of 13, 0 out of 26. Look at all the zeros for both bugs, and here's the stats when compared to the controls. So a significant difference. This didn't happen by chance. Okay? So the good news was, all yeah, right, there's options here. We don't have to just worry about one company cornering the market. So there's different things we can do. Okay? Now, last thing. Let's take it to the field. Because all that stuff's really cool, but if it doesn't help you, it's not worth beans. Okay? Let's take it to the field. This is a project that's underway. You heard uh, Jim talk about PERSCAP, funding you some, uh, some dollars for your, your eradication project. PERSCAP also provides me with funds to do these studies. And this is a PERSCAP 2, along with National Port Board and Minnesota Port Board funded project that's basically looking at to see if air filtration works in breeding herds in swine dense regions. You know, we've already been doing this on the boar studs for many years. We've got 25 boar studs now filtered throughout southern Minnesota and northern Iowa. None of them have broke. So we know it works good on the boar studs. What about the sow farts? That's a lot more challenging. We've got to produce this negative pig. We can produce a negative weaned pig. There's so much money that can be made on that pig performance versus when it's infected prior weaning. Such a big difference. That's really the link between success and failure is production of that negative weaning pig. All right, so this is a study between our group at Minnesota, South Dakota State, where I've got an engineer friend of mine who designs these systems, and three vet clinics in southern Minnesota, Pipestone, Fairmont, and the Swine Vet Center. So southern Minnesota is where we have a whole bunch of pigs. And all these guys got herds in northern Iowa, too. So a very hog-dense region. To participate in this study, 
We want a, a large sow inventory, so 2,400 sows or more. They've got to have a history, a diagnostic history of at least three new infections over the prior four years. Okay, so at least three, three or more times over the four years before they filtered, they became infected with a new virus. They sequenced it and they proved it was a new virus. They had to show me those data before they can qualify for this study. They have to have at least four pig farms that they don't flow animals to within a three mile radius. And four or more pig sites. We want to have dense population of buildings. And they also have to have what I'll call industry standard biosecurity. Biosecurity for all the other routes we've talked about except filters. And despite having all the protocols for trucks, fulmites, people, bugs, pigs, semen, they broke year after year after year, almost to the point where they had an expense of a purse break in their cash flow. It's, it's, it's true. A lot of these guys had that break in their cash flow every year because it was such a repeatable event. So those are the farms I wanted. Almost like farms that almost need a liver transplant or else they're going to go under. You know, we got to, let's take it to the worst possible scenario. Highest challenge. It's a four-year project. We're measuring to see how often new viruses get into filtered farms versus control farms, which are, again, non-filtered farms. And we'll try to measure some cost-benefit in the end. Okay, this is a really important slide. I want to show you this slide. I'm actually quite proud of this slide. Right now, we've got 10 filtered farms in this study that have been filtered long enough to talk about. I've got another set of 10 farms that just got done, so I'm not going to waste my time with them because they're starting to get going. But here are 10 farms that have been filtered that fulfill the criteria of the study. And these are the days post-filtration, okay? Now, each of these bars is a farm. The first group started in September of 08. There were five farms that filtered back in September of 08. And there is another group of five that began in September of 09. As I mentioned, in September of 10, we had another set of, actually 10. But we'll, we'll talk about those right now. So what this is showing you here is farm one, for example, has now been filtered for 920 days as of today and is not broken. Same with farm two, same with farm three. Now these farms used to break every year to participate in the study. These two farms, see some numbers here, these two farms did have a break at 438 days post-filtration and 460 days post-filtration. They did indeed break with the new virus. This farm broke due to uh, biosecurity breaches with trucks. This farm broke biosecurity breaches with personnel captured on security camp. So I believe, as best as I can tell, these farms broke for other reasons than here. But it shows you the value of having, you've got to have the whole program, because the filters aren't going to stop the truck problems. They're not going to stop the people errors. They can only stop the airborne. So filter farms can become infected. But look at that. They kind of got back on the horse and corrected the problem. They haven't broke since. And so they made a mistake, but they realized what they did. And they proved their process. So group two right now is 555 days along, and they have not, none of those farms have broken. So every day is a big tour. All right, now every good study, oh, I'm sorry, let's go back, let's go back. Let's go back to these two farms again, because some, at first they thought they were, they failed, you know, no, they're not going to fail. I don't think so. Let's look at these two farms. So these are the frequency of infection before and after filtering in these particular two cases. Here's their inventories, 3,000 sows or more. Here's a number of farms within a three mile radius. This farm has 17 finishing barns in three miles that, don't, that none of the pigs from the south farm go to any of these finishing sites. Pigs from all over North America come into this area. This farm has nine barns out of its flow within the three mile radius. Here are the number of infections that they had the four years or the 48 months before they filtered. So going back to the diagnostic history, this first farm broke seven times with new viruses over that four-year period before they filtered. This herd broke four times 
before they again over that four year, four year period of time. So this is one infection every seven months in this first case, and one infection every 12 months. Now, after they filtered, we're at the 30-month period now, post-filtration, so we're not quite caught up yet. We don't have four years of data, but they broke once. That's one every 30 months. Now, we did have breaks, but we are seeing differences between the frequency of breaks in these two farms. Now, every good study has controls, right? Every good study has controls, in this case, non-filtered farms. We've got 30 controls to go with our 10 treatments. And here are control herd data over the same 30-month period of time. We've got new virus introduction in 93% of those non-filtered farms, despite all the biosecurity protocols for everything else. And of those 28 farms, notice that they've broke more than once in a lot of cases. Some poor guys have broke three times in the last three months. And we do the stats. Right now we see reinfection is less likely in filtered herds when compared to non-filtered farms. Okay. Now, last thing I want to tell you about is how we're stopping backdrafting. Because anytime you think about air filtration, you got to think about backdrafting. Because backdrafting is the entry of dirty air through a non-filtered point. So what happens if we filter these buildings and then the fans go out or a fan stops running? That's a non-filtered point. Air is going to go through the path of least resistance. It's going to sneak right through that idle fan. It's going to backdraft its way backwards into that fairing house, for example, in stage two fan shuts down. <coughs> We've been working real hard with industry to come up with some tools to try to reduce this risk. I'll explain those to you now. So we did a study to test a number of products put together by a company in our, in our state called Biosecure Air. Biosecure air, we basically, I'll show you some pictures, but we're going to, we're going to test backdrafting through a standard plastic shutter, through a plastic shutter with a canvas cover, I'll show you a picture, through a windsock as a cover for a fan, a double shutter, and then a new, a, a new shutter, and then this windsock. We're going to challenge these with different levels of virus. Here, so here's what we're doing. This is at our research farm again. Here we've got our fogger full of virus, and here's a standard plastic shutter. This is an idle fan. We've got another fan running in the building. We're creating a 0.25 static pressure, pulling air through that backdrafted fan. We're creating a backdrafted situation. So we'll fog virus out here that's 18 inches away. Now 18 inches on the other side is our air collector. We're going to see if virus can get through these various interventions. Pretty straightforward. So we fog out here with high, medium, and low concentrations of virus and test on the inside to see what comes through. Okay. So here's the first, the shutter alone. This is a four-year-old shutter. It's been on the building since it, we've set it up. It's been in pretty good shape. Here's a canvas cover that hangs over the shutter. And the principle is when the, when the fan is off, the negative pressure of the facility pulls that canvas cover tight up against that housing, providing another layer. And when the fan starts up again, the, the thing flips up. So you can see it's canvas. It's got a counterweight on the bottom. So here, again, here we're fogging 18 inches away, different quantities of virus. And here on the inside, you can see there's the plastic shutter, and then there's the canvas, OK? So that's kind of the first thing we tried on these farms a number of years ago. This is a parachute or a windsock. It's a nylon fabric, like a big windsock. When the fan turns on, whew, you got a big tube of, of air in this windsock. Here, the fan is off, and the windsock is sucked up against that housing. <coughs> so it's the same principle, but it's a different product, it's a different material. And here you can see on the inside, all you can kind of see is a windsock. We don't have the plastic shutter on anymore. It's a windsock only. Okay. Here's a double shutter which is basically the existing shutter plus a new aluminum shutter on the inside. So two shutters working together in concert with one another. Here's the new aluminum shutter and the parachute. So two layers. You put the old shutter out, put the new shutter in, put a parachute on the outside. Here's what we learned. Here's the plastic shutter alone, the plastic shutter with the canvas, the parachute, 
the double shutter and the aluminum shutter parachute. Here's the low virus, that's, that's 10 to the 1, 10 to the 3, so high levels, intermediate levels, and low levels of challenge. So here's the plastic shutter at low levels of virus. 10 out of 10 times, even with very low quantities of virus on the outside, virus got through that shutter. It leaked backwards, it backdrafted through that shutter. <coughs> Even though the shutter was pulled tight, there's enough leakage through those shutters. Higher quantities of virus, you see no problem. So we proved that backdrafting is real. First of all, it's real now. We know if virus is on the outside, you can get through. When we put the canvas covers on, you can see some of the differences. We dropped it down, except at the high concentration. It wasn't significant. But we did, we did reduce it significantly, but we didn't prevent it. The problem with these things is if you get a crosswind, they start flapping and moving. And so they don't give you that really nice seal. That's how that happened. But look at everything else. All of the other interventions <coughs> stopped backdrafting. All those other interventions worked equally. So again, options for producers with different budgets, with different fan styles, different housing. More options is better. So here's a plastic shutter again, backdrafting occurred. There's our canvas, <coughs> dropped it down. And the other three interventions. So, in closing, 10 long years later, after the battle, we know how this virus moves around. We know how to stop it. And we've got science-based biosecurity protocols that we can apply. And in the case of southern Minnesota, northern Iowa, it's becoming, I think, more evident now that air filtration is an essential component of an effective biosecurity plan. Okay. So that's what I have. We're right on time for some discussion. I want to thank Beth. I want to thank Laura. And I want to open it up for any other questions you might have about anything that we've talked about here that may not be clear, or what we're doing in some of the herds in our southern zone. Yes, sir? What's the uh, risk of contamination if you're dealing with a uh, uh, family that would have half a dozen 4-H pigs that would be first positive within an hour or less of a April unit? There have been some cases where there's been uh, similar sequences from small backyard populations that have infected large operations. So that has been published. So the risk is there. Yeah, the risk is there. Obviously, those well, those pigs have to be shedding. You have to have the right conditions for that airborne spread to occur, as we talked about. But, you know, it doesn't, PERS is so infectious, it doesn't take many virus particles to infect animals. So you don't need I mean, just look at our little, that's only a 300 head growth finish barn, and look how that was able to produce uh, an aerosol plume. So be it 4-H or be it whatever, be it feral pigs or be it whatever, if you've got pigs nearby and they're infected with PERS, your herd's at risk. Same with microplasma lens as well? I would agree, yeah. We have also, I didn't show it, but we found microplasma out to the same distance in that 9.1 kilometer study I showed you. So that also has long distance airborne communicability. Yep. Yes. <coughs> so if you put um, the parachutes in all the fans, mm -hmm. but you got seal on that list, you know, when the air goes through the attic. Do you have any study on that where you get the air through the attic, through the seal lets into like a ferro room, stuff like that? That's where the filters go. <coughs> So the filters in these farms are up in the attic, and they're over the ceiling inlets. And so contaminated, just like you said, is right. Contaminated air comes up to the soffits, and the negative pressure pulls it through. That's where the filter banks, or the filter boxes are placed. We're also on the outside of the cool cell, in combination. So that would, otherwise, yeah, you'd have dirty air coming through the ceiling inlets. Exactly right. Jack, could you tell me on your filter spires, what extra construction had to be done? doorways and stuff to uh, yeah. it's solve quite, the It's quite a process. It's quite a process. Uh, what we call critical control points. Anytime pigs and people go in or out, there's a critical control point. We, those are double door entry points now. And so you've got two doors 
get into the farm. So if you open that outside door, dirty air comes in, you've got a chamber now that captures that air, and actually there's a positive pressure ventilation fan that kicks on when you open that outside door and pushes air out to reduce the risk of dirty air coming back in. So we got it. We have those at all, all four of those points where dead animals go out, where green pigs go out, where people go in and out, where supplies come in. Okay, so double door systems at all those points. We're putting UV lights in those systems too, up in the ceiling, to help kill anything that's on the ground or the floor. Uh, we get infrared heaters in those points too to dry the floors. Again, thinking these are our high risk points for virus to get in. Uh, we caulk the daylight out of these facilities. I mean, we put lots of money into caulking. This is not an easy process. I mean, the whole barn gets re caulked. So we don't have cracks that could have left dirty air in as best we can. And we watch that clock and make sure it's still doing its job. Uh, what risk that is, I don't know. But, you know, these are big investments. And so we're trying to cover all our bases. And I, think, uh, I think we made some major strides with these backdrafting technologies. I'd be really worried, obviously, if we just relied on canvas slabs now after learning what I know, or learning what I, I found out here. <laughs> Um, so it's a, it's a very big process. We've got filter GDUs. You know, we've got filter trailers to move those pigs from the G, filter GDU to the filter building. You know, we're trying to find every possible way to reduce the risk. Because a lot of these, they, a lot of these herds, you know, they're, they're right down in the middle. There's 8 to 10 to 12 to 14 to 22 farms around these, these buildings. And so they're under siege at all times. There's a lot of training. Every month we go to the farms, we have a session with employees, we give them testing, <coughs> actually looking at well, what happens if this happens, you know, situational tests, keep track of their scores, see how they do. Do they really understand the biosecurity? So you just can't walk in the door anymore and take a shower. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different change of behavior, and it's a big process. So it's, it's not as simple as just throwing the filters up. And again, you got to have everything else right. You got to your trucks figured out. You got to, you know, all the other wrongs. So it's a real comprehensive approach. So there's a lot, Jim. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, one with the agents you were using for sterilizing. Was chlorine ever used? Did that do anything or not? Or bleach wood? It was just so caustic. We didn't want it mess with okay. it because of the fumes and the damage, but bleach would kill the birds in seconds. Okay. Yep. Second question, for the blood testing, was a different NATO used every single time, or was there some type of process of cleaning the NATO for the blood testing? In our farm? Yes. Every, every pig was blood of a different one. So, you know, I'm sure you're interested, you know, probably asking questions about cost of this film. I mean, everybody does. Uh, on average, we're seeing now uh, about a $140 a sound of total product and materials with a range of $100 to $200 a sound. Depending on if you had add a new pig loadout, you have to do some construction on your building. So there's some costs there, but does anybody know what a per break costs per sound? It's 200, 250 bucks a sound. So our philosophy is if we prevent one break, we pay for the next break. And so every year we prevent a break from happening that used to happen year after year after year, we brought a bigger return. So we haven't done the real, real calculations yet, but those are some pretty accurate costs. You amortize that out, that's about a buck to two bucks a pig. Over time, amortized. So what's the first cost per pig? Five to fifteen dollars a pig. We've got flows now out of filtered farms that are staying negative through wean to finish. Twelve to fifteen bucks profit. Getting that pig negative out of that south farm, getting it into a negative wean to finish flow, that's bringing these the latest data I just saw, twelve to fifteen dollars a head. Profit. So the numbers are starting to, starting to get some, some little traction on this now. So we'll keep doing the math and see what happens. <coughs> Those are the figures. They're kind of scary up front. 
but we're looking at you know these these farms breaking every year. There have to be something, or they're going to be turned into finishing farms. Yeah. How do you pump manure uh, in those farms? How do you know you pump manure? We've got uh, a couple different ways of doing it. I think the best way is. Uh, producers have put some stainless channeling down the, uh, the pit pump openings, and there's PVC planks that slide down. After the cover comes off, this plank slides down, down into the slurry. You know, gets down to about two feet from the bottom of the pit, so you can still put your agitator in there. But there's a there's a barrier there now, a solid barrier, that so you don't have that air leak that comes when you open the cover up into the pit and up into the, the building. Uh, that's the best thing I've seen. I've seen big, heavy tarps with counterweights that get rolled out when those covers come off. Those are okay if you don't have real bad winds. If you get a real bad wind, those tarps will start to move and then it'll open up. And then I've seen uh, just big tarps put over the cover once the machinery gets put in. So it's a real kind of a fast and furious covering of the hole after the, after the machinery gets put in. So, that's a, that's a, we're always really nervous around that time for lots of reasons. Uh, it's kind of an uncontrolled entity. But a lot of these farms are buying more of their own equipment. They've got barriers where the, the higher equipment doesn't come on any closer. They've got their own hoses starting to put together some of their own equipment. So they're trying to get a better handle on that. So that's... How do they change the service filters? Oh, good question. I was hoping somebody would ask this. Uh, basically, these filters have a free filter on the top. And so a free filter is just a furnace filter, about three bucks a piece. And their job is to keep the $120 filters clean. And we change those about every six months, those free filters. We haven't had to change a set of big filters yet. Been into three years now on cell farms, and actually five years on the bore studs. None of the bore studs have had their filters removed yet, as long as they've just done the pre-filter maintenance. So it, our original thought was, well, maybe we'll get two years out of them. We'll, we'll be on that. So that's going to help change the map a bit as far as the maintenance cost that we were predicting at first. So that's been a nice surprise. And we don't have to change these cartridge filters, these expensive filters, to the top. Then you would have to use a couple horsepower of fans? In some cases, yep. Some, some buildings haven't had enough fan power, so that's where some of that additional cost comes in per operation, because you might have to put a bunch of new fans in. Some of the buildings are overventilated, and it doesn't seem to affect their. So that's why I can't give you a fixed price for, to do this, because it ranges so much based on. Ventilation system, add-ons that you got to do, things you choose to do while you're going through all of this. So, but 100 to 200 is, is pretty, is pretty routine. Yeah. And the one cell unit that total personnel brief, what was the action consistent with all of your previous? Yes, the electrician came to the farm. Uh, he came from a, we didn't know this at the time, he came from a pig farm. He brought equipment into that, our pig farm he was supposed to bring in, even though there's, he brought that in, so we got captured all this on pay. He didn't shower and he came, he came through with dry hair uh, after going through the shower. And um, there were some compliance issues with some of the people in these, in these entry points where supplies come in, Farm personnel put, I have a, there's a separate boot and coverall that they wear in these particular chambers. And we had people coming in and not doing that, taking these materials that we found out later had been on an infected farm, right into the farm without any type of disinfection. So it flew in the face of everything that we've been doing in regards to fomites and personnel entry. That was an ugly take. But glad that was the one farm we had cameras. They're trying to get cameras in all these farms, they only got them in one. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. All that clean I guess. Like, they're not. 
So that's the situation. Yes. Any of the sound units the box Full plug No. Yeah. Yes. Two two questions. One on like your del uh, the folks doing delivery routes uh, to go through all the different chambers. They go through a Danish style system between or just hand washing protocols before delivery. Uh, so I guess just wondering about what the, <laughs> somebody is to deliver supplies, whatever that may be. Uh, they themselves go through. A Danish style system, or if they're not entering the unit physically. Yeah, the the, the rule is that that the, the, the delivery person doesn't come in. He comes to the door of this what we call a D and D room, disinfection decontamination room. Uh, somebody from the farm enters that chamber and puts on the designated boots and coveralls and gloves. And receives the materials and closes the door, and operates the door. And then the, the materials get disinfected and for at least one hour, based on the 60-minute data I showed earlier. And then again, there's a UV and the drying, etc. too. So that's the protocol. The outside person never comes in. Right. The other question was like on tunnel ventilated barns, you mentioned we're filtering the cool cells. Uh, what does that filter, I mean, if you're talking to have a filter, what is that? Is that an all one piece filter over, say, if you didn't have a cool cell or over that big tunnel curtain? What's no, that that's, look like? These filtered cartridges, you know, there's, different, there's different kinds. There's uh, a lot of these are filtered cartridges, you know, two feet by two feet, one foot deep. And so they'll build a bank of those right in front of a cool cell. There's a, a filter that Laura studied a lot from Quebec. It's more of a fabric with antimicrobial chemicals in its fabric. That's what actually worked. We tested that one up there. It worked very well. That was more of a sheet, so it's got a different type of application. So, yeah, that's kind of how they're set up. It's been quite a process. Now, are you familiar with their farm and how the projects that became infected, so they put the fabric covers on the exhaust fans to try to prevent the virus from getting out and being able to last? That was a fun, was that in Ontario? Yeah. yeah. And um, was, is that holding up as no. far as? Yeah. <laughs> they use this antimicrobial filter because, as Scott said, it's a plot, so it's easier to put. Um, the problem is this winter has been really bad, so it got clogged because of the dust, and then it froze because of the cold, you know, yeah. because it's on the outside. And so right now, since Scott, we're going to start doing some research on trying to understand how to do this because I think what Scott has developed, it really prevents. Mm -hmm. But when we have areas where they have gone through all this control and elimination and then they break for whatever reason, which Scott has always said, then the problem is you have all these farms that are negative and if they're not filtrated, then these are the sources to send it to others. <coughs> so unfortunately, it did not hold because it was just like we every, the, the veterinarian got this idea said we should put it but <laughs> it gets clogged and it gets frozen so we'll have to start again with the antifreeze and the pre-filter for the dust and never ending story sorry but it's very interesting because people that are right now in this ARC and E projects that are starting to stabilize now the thing is, if you break, now, you know, what can we do to prevent the other farms that have been working hard? So for us, it, that's the next part. And we are actually starting next week a project to try to see how we can pre-filter that exhausting air, particularly from dust. Uh, the virus, we have proved, as Scott said, that this filter will filtrate it, but we need to work with the humidity and the particles. So, work in progress as always. Yeah. Yes, Beth. Could you reflect a little bit on uh, aerial spread from trucks hauling things and the need for designated truck trucking routes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, a, a truck full of infected pigs driving by a farm. And Laura and I have tried, we were talking about that today. We both tried to put grants in to get that tested, and we haven't been successful yet. So most likely it's an infrequent event, but it's an interesting question. So I think you'd have to have a lot of things go right 
first of all, you'd have to have a lot of defective pigs on the trailer, obviously. I think you'd have to be moving very slowly by the building because of our data on the airspeed. You know, if it's going by too fast, that viral flume is going to break up. You know, on high moving, on high velocity air data, we didn't find virus in the air. These were slow moving winds. And so the, the guy going by 70 miles an hour, I think that's a really, really low risk. Now, if he's creeping along and you've got a lot of virus coming out and he's got a chance to maintain that plume, clearly that's more of a, a higher risk factor. So I believe it could happen, but the conditions have to be perfect.